Today's reading is from Psalm 27 of David. Please stand. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord to be, uh, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we continue our Lenten journey this morning with this powerful psalm, which is in part statement, part plea, and all prayer. In the first verse, we get the affirmation of the certainty of God's presence and his protection. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The psalmist begins with this strong statement. It's a good place to start, and it brings to the forefront the issue that a lot of folks deal with on a regular, if not daily basis, fear. God is our light and our salvation. Of whom shall we fear? And I suppose if we could all live perfectly into that example that Crystal showed us this morning of holding a Ziploc bag in front of a candle and knowing that if we just could remember to put God first, that uh, the fears and the things that concern us wouldn't have the capacity to blow out our light, that would be great. But we can't always do that with things that we are troubled by or things that bring uncertainty or those things that we can't predict or control. Now, the second part of the psalm, the psalmist does go on to mention things that are uncertain or troubling or frightening, enemies and adversaries, war, being forsaken or abandoned. In verse 7, he writes, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. 
It, it almost sounds like the two sections of this psalm should be reversed because it would be a little bit more compelling to begin with what is lacking or hoped for and move toward powerful conviction from doubt to certainty, from dark to light. After all, that's how sermons are supposed to work, aren't they? From dark to light, from doubt to certainty, from whatever, or how life ought to work, how faith ought to work, but rarely do they cooperate in such a tidy fashion. See, the fact of the matter is, life is messy, and no amount of doctrine or dogma changes it. So did the psalmist intend for us to spend a little time in the space between certainty and uncertainty, light and dark, trust and doubt, so that we might be more willing to turn our fears over to God, to accept that we're more likely to grow in faith when we are being stretched than when we are comfortable. See, there's a delicate balance between the realities of human concern and the assurance of divine help. This psalm may speak most potently to the person who has faced or is facing difficulty, yet has received some relief from initial pain. It serves as gentle guidance to someone who is afraid or uncertain about the future. It provides an earthy honesty as it dances between fear and trust. Will the treatment work? Is the counseling worthwhile? Does one failed attempt mean the end of the road? Are transitions always this hard? Now, some may say that uh, uncertainty is a lack of faith. And I would contend that the adversary uses any means possible to stir up our fears and that scripture pokes holes in this particular misdirection. Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 1, says this, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Our greatest biblical witnesses experienced uncertainty. Moses and Abraham and King David in the Old Testament. Peter and Paul and the other disciples in the New Testament. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that faith exempted them from uncertainty and struggle. Faith is not about doctrine. It's about the truth of what we have known and experienced in Scripture and in our lives. Faith begins at the intersection between religious ideas and real life, humbly bringing about soaring trust, persistent doubt, and everything in between into conversation with the scripture, with church tradition, with the chorus of witnesses that have gone before us, and with the Holy Spirit who works in and through everything. So if the faithful are not exempted from uncertainty, how can we see it as a gift rather than a curse? Is a certain amount of uncertainty necessary to keep us awake, aware, and engaged. Okay, I'm going to give you a very practical and not particularly theological example. Are you ready? How inclined would you be to watch a movie or a sports event that you already knew exactly how everything was going to turn out and what the end was going to be? Not so much, right? Just this week, I watched the Westminster Dog Show. I had to record the second half and intentionally tried to avoid any media that would spoil the end to know what the, what the best dog and show was. And all of my efforts were for naught when a particular dog food commercial aired before I could watch the recording, boasting that it was the brand of choice for the best of show breeds for... 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, and they showed the picture of that German short hair. I'm just telling you, knowing the outcome takes something away from experiencing the journey. 
Here's another not so theological example. When you and your spouse go out to eat and the wait person asks you what your spouse wants to drink, what they want to drink, do you know what he or she would order or do you guess correctly 99% of the time? <laughs> and can you still be surprised by their choice? I mean, 99.9 .9 times out of 100, the man is going to have unsweet iced tea. And the one time I say he's going to have unsweet iced tea, he picks something else. <laughs> Too much certainty removes the adventure from life. It sucks the joy out of relationships. A gentleman described his 30-year marriage as being married to 29 different women, all who coincidentally happened to be named Mariana. <laughs> okay, now that may be more uncertainty than we're willing to handle. <laughs> but some amount of uncertainty helps to keep things interesting. Please hear me clearly. I'm not talking about the kind of uncertainty that increases chaos, but the kind that develops trust. The kind that develops trust. Author John Ortberg observes in his book, Faith and Doubt, we all think we want certainty, but we don't. But what we really want is trust wisely placed. Trust is better than certainty because it honors the freedom of persons and makes possible growth and intimacy that certainty alone could never produce. Orberg is talking about our relationship with the Lord. We may say that we want to know with certainty what will happen in our lives, but if God did grant that request, we might stumble under the extreme weight of that knowledge, or we might not ever really grow up in the likeness of Christ because there was no challenge to do so. We may not, may not develop the trust wisely placed that helps us to embrace life as a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. There's a poet named David White. He tells about a time when his soul felt trapped in a prison cell of certainty and predictability. He moved to take a job in a field and for a cause that he believed in and whose mission he supported. But as the weeks turned into months, the administrative tasks and details of that work began to take a bite out of his enthusiasm his interest in the work began to wither, as did his energy and patience, and eventually it was only his unwavering belief in the organization's cause that kept him trudging to work every day. Almost at the end of his rope, White had a life-changing conversation with a friend who was also a Benedictine monk. White talked to him about his exhaustion Brother, tell me about exhaustion. And his friend gave him his full attention and finally said in the form both of a question and an assertion, you know, the antidote to exhaustion is not necessarily rest. Well, what is it then? The antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness. The friend went on to tell White, you are so tired through and through because a good half of what you do here in this organization has nothing to do with your God-given talents, the true powers that God has given you, or the place that you have reached in your life. You're only half here, and half here will kill you after a while. You need something where you can live fully into who God intended you to be. And you already know what that is, he said. White had a heart for writing poetry, but he was afraid to let go of certainty lest he fail in some way or flounder in a sea of uncertainty. His friend encouraged him to let go of the burden of certainty and to trust that God would not only meet him where he was 
in the unknown, but would be his light and salvation, the stronghold of his life. How many of us are afraid to let go of what we have now because we don't trust what God has for us on the other side? Certainty and uncertainty. God did not promise that our lives would be full of smooth sailing or that we would not have difficulties or that we would not have growing pains. But God has promised to be with us every step of the way when we are sure of God's presence and even when for whatever reason it seems as though God has forgotten us. We can trust that promise while we wait for the Lord. Be strong, the psalmist says, and let your heart take courage, and we come full circle to where we started. Because this is a beautiful affirmation, and the one that we began with. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.